Hello. Oh, yes, can I just say something? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thank you for coming. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Lynn. And um, wanted to point to two things. Happy to be here as part of the Radical Presence exhibition and, and just want to shout out to Valerie Cassell Oliver yes, for that. Thank you. Um, who curated this show? <laughs> And, and in some ways, uh, well, we talked about it, it'll probably come up, I don't know why I'm saying it, but the, the opportunity to think about Lorraine O'Grady's work, which is what I talked about in the exhibition catalog, was kind of like a, a second piece um, for an essay that Valerie had asked me to do before on another show she did called Double Consciousness. And in that exhibition, I think I talked about what now is a pretty decent pair if I could say so myself, um, is Adrian Piper on the first hand and then Lorraine O'Grady on the second hand. And so I thought that was worth noting. And, and I also just want to also shout out to um, Prospect because in light of our conversation and who we're speaking with, I have to say that the, the biennial idea or concept is something that is, uh, I'm obviously thinking about a lot right now and Brooke Anderson is here from Prospect and the front executive director and NYU alum Elizabeth Barabo is also here from Prospect. So I just wanted to mention that. And, and I also got to read the, the, the beginning of the last book and I'm happy I read it now, like when I feel like I'm almost done because, <laughs> because as a history, as a whole, and it's something that I thought I knew it was really illuminating to just to just run through some of the things that you talk about in the introduction alone. Thank you. That's great. And I'm so pleased to be able to speak with um, Franklin, who has like this amazing kind of curatorial record. I was looking through his CV, almost as heavy as my book. <laughs> you know, and he's really curated or been on the curatorial team of you know more than 50 exhibitions. I mean, really a, a, an astounding kind of record of of engaging art in the context of display, as well as writing about art, which we'll get to later, I think. But why don't we start with um, Prospect and talk about um, kind of how you're thinking about the show and sort of more broadly how working on a show like that, in particular that show, but a biennial something with that sort of framing, has sort of kind of affected or been in tension with other curatorial work you've done? Um, it's. I guess my first thoughts around the exhibition were just to be open and see what came back from talking to artists and to have that sort of incubator <coughs> time to allow artists to direct the discussion. Um, in some ways, I think it, it relates back to trying to get to a place where you could be a little bit non-thematic, where you could be more open-ended. Um, something that relates, I think, to a lot of the earlier exhibitions when we talk about places like Venice or San Paolo or, or even Documenta, for that matter, before, uh, before, before Zayman's show, you could say, this is Documenta, it is what it is, and it will be a representation, I guess, of what we want to look at for the last few years, but it doesn't have to be around a given theme. New Orleans, likewise, of course, is built on this idea that it is somewhat of a post-Hurricane Katrina initiative. I mean, that really was um, part of what, where it comes from. And so I think if you look at the first one, if you look at the catalog, you'll see how you could just call it prospect and it could be ostensibly about New Orleans and need not reflect any other authorial stance. Um, and I kind of believe that having seen that one, having seen the second one, which probably was still, you know, having to deal with many of the same issues as the first one, that it, there came a point where it was like, okay, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Sure, it's there, it'll be part of the discussion, but it's not your central focus. And so that has led me to <coughs> thinking around other issues, and I guess one of the nice things in terms of of working on an exhibition like that at the same time as working at a, an in, a large institution in LA um, is the fact that you know time works differently, the artist you're looking at works differently, you're not thinking about working with somebody for the next three years, 
you're thinking about working with them on a very specific project in a very specific place. And so the, I, I love that, that sort of balance. Um, and in the process of talking to artists, of course, it also gets mixed up completely. Um, there are artists that think would be great for LACMA, there are artists I think would be great for Prospect, and there are some that are perfect for both. So it, 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 the whole conversation gets informed um, by different avenues. I should also say, in relation to LACMA, I'm being advised by um, my colleagues there, Rita Gonzalez and Christine Kim, and, um, and even more recently, Jarrett Gregory. So we are having a conversation that is around a general idea of being in the same um, office as each other all the time and bumping into each other and just thinking about what it is we see and who we're interested in. So that's kind of um, where it comes from. And, and I have chosen to, to now, after those conversations and after seeing what direction artists seem to be going in, have come up with this theme. I think a lot of, for me, literature plays a really big role um, and was, I guess, the, the sort of impetus for a lot of my thinking uh, around the exhibition. The exhibition as a whole is called Notes for Now, but the main exhibition that I'm concerned with is Somewhere and Not Anywhere and trying to posit, you know, dealing with that idea of, okay, this is New Orleans, how do we make a show that is about here, um, but also not anywhere, but somewhere else as well. Um, it's a, a <coughs> phrase that comes from the book, The Movie Goer, uh, by Walker Percy. And, and I think for me that locates things in a very, very specific place. <coughs> Uh, he's known as an existentialist writer, but an artist who was born in Alabama, lived most of his life in Mississippi, um, and coming from a very much of a, a, a southern stance, or spent most of his life in Louisiana, um, but was very much influenced by writers, in particular Mississippi writers like William Faulkner, um, Richard Wright, and thinking about that kind of past and what that means uh, then coupled with somebody who was studying Kierkegaard and, and looking very closely at Camus, looking very closely at Barth. And so that was, um, I think, it, it gives a certain sense of location. Um, I could go on about that uh, one, but. Well, I'm curious, I mean, you mentioned that there's a kind of, the show has a larger title. Yes. And then the part you're working on is a, you know, kind of a sub yes. part of that. How's it structured, the exhibition? <coughs> well, Although I'm sure it's in process, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But as, you know, I, I've, um, I forget at what point, but at a certain point, you, you talk about some of these types of exhibitions and how, you know, it turns into um, a citywide type of thing, right? So not only are we talking about a citywide exhibition, um, which includes somewhere like 15 venues, which will bring you around the city, there are also other venues that will do things um, not in conjunction but, but in, in conversation with the wider exhibition. So I think of that whole as being notes for now. And mm -hmm. I have had conversations in that regard. And it's interesting. I mean, this, you, you mentioned the kind of um, structure of events kind of in, in kind of being um, sort of created throughout a whole city around biennials. Etc. And one thing I was really interested to see in, in looking a bit at, at, at Franco's work was that he spent a long time as an art journalist and in the late 90s was in, based in Europe for some time and really had a kind of experience of the art world and of art making and art display that very few people have except journalists. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to maybe learn a bit about um, sort of the work you did then, and, and really just how that might have affected how you look at contemporary art and um, exhibitions, etc. Because he was there at what, 97? 96 to 98. Yeah, yeah. So that's a key time in the development of international exhibitions in Europe and Africa. He, I, I saw that he had interviewed all the curators mm -hmm. of um, the second Johannesburg Biennial, which was um, kind of the artistic director was Oakley and Wiesor, and he kind of had six, six? I think so. Yeah. Oh, Something like six curators doing separate shows kind of throughout 
the city and also actually some throughout South Africa. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious about how, how that experience in, you know, in that period of exhibition making and of yeah. art making in Europe sort of informed you. Well, I, I guess in some ways, like coming to some sort of degree of, of knowing how to, to actually look and knowing how to think, probably like at least, at least thinking that you, you have some sort of apparatus in which to think about contemporary art somehow in the early 90s. And of course, you know, that is on, on the shoulders of things like, I went to Wesleyan University, so it's one of the earliest um, departments of African American art or African American history, um, or even a lot of ethnic studies. And so coming out of a sort of a progressive conversation, I would imagine, and, and thinking about things like the Decade Show, um, things like Studio Museum, like the Alternative Museum, like Exit Art. Like that was sort of a, a, a backbone. Um, by the same token, my interest in school and study was Basquiat. So somebody who, who offers, I think, interesting ways of thinking about uh, a conceptualism that comes, say, after the, the 80s, um, but also a, a way of thinking about a, a much more wider market and, and trajectory around histories of art. Um, so from there, I was like, I worked at DIA and, and, and really considered from a literary point of view and from a writing point of view. Um, I did art history in English, but I say the English was probably much more important to me. And, you know, it's not like they had, I don't think we had a class on contemporary art, so I probably did a pre-45 and a post-45, which might have gotten to 80, I don't know. Um, so coming out of, of that sort of, of background, I was under the idea that, yeah, you could, you could write, you could kind of do a show here or there, but the, the emphasis was on writing. Um, you know, and eventually you find out, hmm, how are you going to actually pay for that? But, um, but that really was the idea. And I, so I was writing for Publishers Weekly, and I was writing for, like, uh, a magazine out in Brooklyn called New Word, which had a bunch of writers you've heard of now, Scott Pulse and Brian, Kevin Powell, Joe Morgan, um, who were, were writing on this magazine that was basically a startup at that time. And I had that, the art angle, while the large part of it was about music and popular culture. Um, so coming out of that and, and wanting to, to think about things through writing was really the sort of um, backbone. And to be at, when I was at D, I I was in the publications <coughs> department, not in the curatorial <coughs> department. So I was also dealing with writers and being that person, although I was probably making like travel arrangements, but I was on the phone with a lot of these people, Andrew Ross from here, um, Trisha Rose, uh, and, and thinking about those kind of authors. And we were also, I mean, this was a time when publications were still um, possible in a big way. So we were doing discussions in contemporary <laughs> culture. Uh, and some of the books that came out of that are like Technology on the Brink, um, uh, visual display, and doing books by artists like Anne Hamilton, Jessica Stockholder, all at the same time. So it was a, it was a, a interesting time to be thinking about those things. And really, for me, that, that is where, where the interest comes from, and I, I think it moves from there. So that's what led me to be in Europe and be at Flash Art um, from 96 to 98, was I had started writing reviews for art news and flash art at that time. Um, and somehow, Francesco Bonami, who was one of the people in the Johannesburg catalog, um, asked uh, if I would be interested in the news editor position, which is a really kooky position. You, you go there and you live, basically live on top of the office uh, in a wonderful flat, and they've got you there. And <laughs> you're, you're also the only person who speaks English native tongue in the entire office, which is about 30 people. So it's, it's, it's this weird thing. And of course, at the time, I mean, I, I doubt it's changed, but I was paid in cash um, at the end of the month, like a little wad on my desk. And, and at that time, it was so long ago, it was still in Lyra. Uh, so it was, it was very different from being at DIA for three years, but 
you know, I wouldn't take it back. But the things you saw there, I mean, it's yeah. a, it's a, one, one thing that, that it occurs to me is, you know, the, you know, in the old days, when people really could not study contemporary art in universities or in graduate programs, most of the curators of contemporary art really came out of art journalism yeah. and as critics, or out of the trade, actually, yeah. in some cases. And which is actually the background that you had. Yeah. I mean, that really you started to look at art not as someone that was studying it in an academic way, mm -hmm. but actually as a reviewer, as somebody going to exhibitions, you know, talking to artists, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of a, there aren't that many people now that started that way, that aren't of an earlier generation. So I found that really interesting. Yeah. So, so what, I mean, that was, like, first of all, you were in Europe, you were in Milan, right? Yeah. Milan. And, um, getting to see these amazing exhibitions that other curators of your generation here, you know, did not see. And they were very, I'm always struck by how provincial New York City is, or the New York art world, and how my friends in Europe are always telling me about things that I, you know, had no idea of. I mean, now there's a little more imagery moving around on the internet, but you have to kind of focus on it. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how that sort of affected you and changed your perspective? Oh, it's or huge. I mean, I, it's, it's everything in a way, because I think, you know, I, being at DIA, being in Chelsea, I mean, of course, you're going to see things coming in and out, but, but there's no uh, comparison, especially when you're in a position where you don't necessarily know the language, and so you have to you have to get by on that as well, and you're learning through other people in some ways. Um, the exposure to different art and artists at that time was part of the magazine, but then it was also a, a much bigger thing about being able to move around in that space. So I, I remember, I think the first issue when I got there was fall of 96, and we talked about the traffic exhibition. Um, and and slowly, we're, there was also, at this time, Inclusion Exclusion, a uh, big show by Peter Weibel in uh, Graz in Austria. And, you know, so I think I talked to him by, yeah, we had email. Barely, but we had email. Um, I talked to him a little bit and then met him there. And, you know, to be there, to be in that space, to see the way that different artists work functioned. Um, to see people that I knew from here, then in a much more international conversation. It, what the, you know, it's immense. I mean, I, I can't. Right. Well, also the kind of way in which the kind of the forms of conceptualization and the, yeah. the different kind of attitudes towards kind of intellectuality and kind of not theory, but kind of bringing literary ideas, other ideas to bear on contemporary art is, I mean, you can kind of. Mm. You know, distort this a little, but still, it's very different in Europe, certainly in those years, than than, than here. And I think coming from literature, it must have obviously, you know, yeah. rang some chord. Definitely. Yeah, can you remember a show that you saw that really struck you as different than, or that, but especially striking, I mean, that you remember? I mean, inclusion and exclusion was huge to me. Um, I. I probably met Okui, no, we had met because of Dia, because we did a show on Bruli Buabre and Boetti. Oh. So we had met briefly, um, but really met in Graz. And there was, I mean, there were a lot of artists from New York in that show, but there were also a ton of artists from South Africa. Candice Brights was one of the, the sort of poster um, artists of that exhibition. Um, and coming into contact on a very one-to-one -one personal level. And of course, you know, being at Flash Art, it, it allowed for you to sort of be a hub for information. And that magazine has been that for a long time. The editorial may not be fantastic, but <laughs> they have information. And at a time when, this, this is the beginning, well, the beginning of when we use the internet for, mm -hmm. So the magazine was gigantic in terms of information at that time, and everybody wanted you know, to have something in there. So that was, um, I mean, I, I remember regretting, I had a great job at DIA. I was making, now in retrospect, really good money. And, and, I, and sometimes, I mean, you know, I know there were times after where I just like, oh God, I can't believe I did this. But 
Yeah, in the end, in, in the end, it worked out. Um, it, th that experience was uh, transformative, um, and I, I'd say that that exhibition was one of the first times when it all sort of came together, and and you know, getting lost. How, how do you get lost between Milan and Graz and end up in Germany? I don't know, but we did it. <laughs> and, and that kind of thing, being able to just um, be lost. I mean. I was born in New York, so living here um, was one thing, and you kind of know it. And so just that, that sense of, well, anything can happen um, was incredible. And inclusion, exclusion definitely did that for me at that time. I mean, I met Candice there. We've been friends ever since. She has an exhibition up in L.A. right now. And so we've, we've been talking about that. We've been talking about the work. Um, there, and there are a lot of people uh, like that. And then 97 is the, you know, sort of a crazy year. It's one of those years where you have um, Documenta, Venice, uh, what else, oh, Munster, all at the same time. So Catherine David's uh, Documenta was that year. Um, Venice that year is Jamal? No. No. Oh, 97? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I think so. Uh, and then the, the, the sort of watershed is, it's the second uh, Johannesburg and the first Guangzhou. No, second Guangzhou, because they were both 95. Yeah. So that was, those were, were, were huge for me. Um, Zayman, Harold Zayman worked on uh, the Guangzhou, and he also had a big exhibition at that time at, um, at the main modern museum in Ljubljana. So going to a show like that, uh, all of those uh, those things tie together. And being in Johannesburg in '97 was you know was, was huge. Right. I mean, you think of the kind of, I mean, culture shock in kind of this kind of deep way yeah. of someone who's used to looking at art in New York City, yeah. you know, as like part of like that world, and then to see this incredibly diffused kind of art world and very dynamic at that, at that moment really must have been amazing. Yeah. I'm sure that's incredible. Why not to kind of change gears a little since our, the occasion of our, our speaking is the show downstairs. Yeah. It, and kind of ask you and just kind of approach that maybe in a sort of indirect way, which is to kind of talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the Adrian Piper's removing, because you mentioned Adrian. Oh removing her work from the exhibition. Um, people might not know that Adrian Piper had asked that a work, a, a video of a work of hers from 1973, uh, Mythic Being, that that video be taken out of the exhibition because even though she respected what the exhibition was doing, she felt that if you really wanted to show the, uh, um, perhaps I'm reconsidering this in some way, kind of the, the value of the work in that exhibition, you would want to juxtapose it with work from kind of other performative work from kind of not a kind of a multi-ethnic show rather than one oriented towards black artists. And this kind of concern of artists to be ghettoized in a way as part of a given ethnic group or given gender or something is kind of something that, that many of our artists have objected to over the years. I'm just wondering about reflecting on that not so much her act of, mm. with regard to this show, mm. but just the idea of doing shows that focus on, you know, work of one ethnicity or whatever. I mean, you I, get the general issue. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's tricky. I mean, I think, there's a, I think there, there is a context, a time, and a place for those exhibitions. Um, I mean, look at Studio Museum. It, it, you know, it's part of the mission. Right. And, and, and it's an, a necessary one. Um, for me, you know, I, it's, it's different, but um, I tried to address some of these things. There's a huge exhibition going around called 30 Americans, um, which is all work from the Rubel collection, but it just happens to be all of the work that was created by African American or black artists in, in the collection. Um, I think it's in Milwaukee now, it'll come to New Orleans. It's been in DC, it's been my, it's been all over the place. Um, but in that catalog, you know, trying to, to, to address that issue, and I don't know if I resolve my feelings, but I, I think that there is a place and a context um, 
And I just try to think outside of that sometimes. Right. I mean, I, I viewed that gesture as one designed to highlight the issue. Yeah. Rather than, yeah. you know, and I don't know quite the history of how it happened, but, yeah. you know, it just seems to me that it does. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because there's a kind of hot, you know, a very clear statement, because she's a very clear thinker, yeah. of, um, you know, sort of her reasons for doing this. And it might not have had she done it before and not participated. Right, right, right. Is that right? Because there's a statement in the gallery, isn't that right? Where she presents her reasons. Right. It's really interesting. Another issue that's interesting to kind of many people right now is the kind of interest among institutions in performance, institutions that were primarily dealing with um, you know, sort of static work. Um, if it was kind of time-based, it would be, you know, video, film, et cetera. Um, and these kind of incredible sort of, um, you know, focus on performance among all institutions, from the smallest to the largest, that had not been previously involved in this. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that, or you can. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting that the Tate had now has, what, the Tate's that are solely for performance. Um, but we, we tend to, to try and think about it within the framework of just the whole exhibition schedule. Right. And I also feel like it's, it's an opportunity to engage on a first-hand level with older work, or for, for, I mean, for us in particular, with other pieces in the collection. And are probably less interested in just uh, a one-off um, performance. For instance, recently we did a series of performances um, with, with Liz Glenn, who did a sort of interaction with several large artworks in the collection. One of them is uh, House of Cards by Sarah, which is huge uh, slabs of metal that are put together somehow and yeah, actually they interact too closely. Right, exactly. Interesting. Which is what kind of what our piece was about. Um, and demonstrating what it took, the effort it took for the 12 guys who put this piece together for one day installation for her to interact with. Um, and we have a lot of work, I think, in that vein to some degree because we also have a huge Richard Serra piece called Band, which is on the first floor of the Broad Contemporary Art Museum. Um, we have one of the largest rocks on display <laughs> that there is in Levitated Mass. Um, so we're thinking about those kind of things. Thinking big. Well, <laughs> yes, yes. And then Liz is also thinking about, well, where does this come from? You know, but maybe why are all these guys? <laughs> um, uh, you know, she also did a, a piece with, um, with uh, some earlier work as well. But th th those was the primary conversation. And I think that's, that's the way that we try to... to right, so, so that, that strategy is really kind of animating the yeah. existing collection yeah. through performance works that are kind of made in relation to it. Absolutely. You know, in addition to sort of exhuming previously non-displayed things yeah. and bringing new things into the collection of an historical period that, that yeah. supplements what, what is there now. Yeah, and I have to say, for the, that's the interesting um, point of departure, I think, f for us in, in that context. Um, where you have all of that, and it's such an important part of the experience of the museum. Most people, like, the first thing you see uh, is, is often going to be either levitated mass if you come in from the northern side, or if you come in from the southern side, it's going to be Chris Burden's Urban Light. Um, so both of these are, are, are dealing with large-scale right. sculpture. Uh, in, a, in a way, and, and, and I think that performance allows us, you know, like those things aren't going to move, and, and the Sarah downstairs isn't going anywhere. So performance has allowed us to challenge those spaces in a way. Uh, another thing that, that has come up is, is performance within the, um, we have a, a large Bruce Nauman video installation. So people trying to perform within that space. Uh, is one way to, that we've been thinking about it. 
Um, for me, it, it comes up more in terms of, of prospect and thinking about how to animate um, how to animate space in a way that is, you know, in conversation with things that are are are, are not, <laughs> with things that are static, and that that there is something interesting that happens uh, when you put those two things together. Um, I would also say that, uh, like after looking at at several large scale productions and talking to several um, artists, is that uh, it forces you to also think, wow, this on one hand is for the theater and, and demands a certain kind of space and a certain kind of, of, um, of work around it. And then there are, are, are things that I think are more malleable and that are more able to respond to situations. And so I'm more interested in those mm -hmm. and the flexibility that they represent. Good. You know, um, I don't. I'm looking at a uh, at the time. Maybe maybe we could open to some questions now. Someone needs to break the ice. <laughs> uh, hi, Franklin. Uh, thank you both for a really interesting conversation. Uh, so, when you are trying to figure out what artists go into what space, following up on your last remarks, do you go to each of those sites and? And figure out what the um, the level of staticness is, uh, um, and and what artist goes in there, and then and how to how to install it. Um, in which con in the context of Lackmore, in the context in, in, in Prospect. Oh. Sorry. Well, in Prospect, thankfully, I mean the other person who's not here is Ilva Rouse, mm -hmm. who's the deputy uh, deputy territorial, mm -hmm. and so she lives there in New Orleans and is really a part of New Orleans and a part of the fabric of the city and works closely with all of the venues there and <coughs> I wouldn't be able to even think about it without her. I may have inclinations and ideas that say this should go here or this should go here and I can see where I would like for artists to be juxtaposed together but there are probably there are some specifics that I think her expertise is definitely better than mine. Um, for the most part, for New Orleans, is that there are there are three major spaces. Um, one of them deals with art of the past and a conversation with the art of the past, which is at New Orleans Museum of Art, and the work there will involve a conversation between Paul Gauguin and Tarsila de Amaral, uh, two artists that. Do don't often get discussed together. Um, one who went to find himself in the other that is often just termed as exoticized uh, in Tahiti in the 1890s. And then the other who was sort of tasked with the idea of finding a, a Brazilian self and a, a nationalist self. And she was married to a guy named Oswald de Andrade who wrote a piece called The Cannibalist Manifesto, um, or Manifesto of Anthropophagia. And within that, they were talking about, and, and amongst not only themselves, but a much larger group, about how do we bring forth a Brazilian identity that is international. This is 20 years before they can make a San Paulo Biennale. Uh, and so this is part of the conversation. I forget what year Brasilia comes into existence, but obviously the country is trying, still trying to define itself. And so one way that they purport was, uh, we must, you know, we must reflect what we are, and and we are African, we are European, we are native, and so they're coming about, they're trying to find themselves in others, and I think that's the, the sort of second major piece of what we were talking about in terms of somewhere, and not anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that'll be at New Orleans Museum of Art, which was founded in 1911, and has collections that go back, you know, far, and also has that that sort of stance where you walk up to the museum and you have to go up the steps like the Met um, or like the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so th it has that architecture and it's sort of alone to itself in some ways. It's, it's at the foot of a huge park in the northern part of the city. Um, the two other venues that I think are central to that conversation are across the street from one another. One is the Ogden Museum of Southern Art and the other is the Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans. 
and so a conversation that is probably more primary to the present will take place in those two places. Cool. Thank you. I wondered about uh, with LACMA, um, it's being in Los Angeles, which is a place where performance in the form of Hollywood movies is such a major enterprise, um, the entertainment industry, whether, whether that has any bearing on your thinking about performance in that context. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Well, we just had our second art and film gala last week. Um, it's, I see, as it relates to performance, um, I think at, at, at heart it is an initiative that recognizes the fact that we are there and that we can't do certain things in terms of past art like the Art Institute of Chicago or the Met, or even MoMA for that matter. Um, LACMA as a place where it's situated now has only been there since 1965, so it's all so fresh and the history of Hollywood is even much deeper than, you know, than what we're talking about. So one way that we have facilitated that discussion is that we've created this event we also are going to be sharing the campus with the Motion Picture Academy, who will be leasing um, some of our older space, uh, a building called the May Building, very soon, and actually have begun collaborations on exhibitions as well. So it's happening that way. I don't know if there's a specific performative aspect to it, but it's, I'm sure it'll come up. That's for sure. <laughs> Franklin, Bruce, thank you very much. This is a wonderful conversation. Um, my question is kind of maybe conceptual, more conceptual. How are you negotiating your role as curator at LACMA, which, and you're talking about it being site specific and your relationship to the history of Hollywood and movie and mm -hmm. so on, um, in relation to Biennials, triennials, which are ephemeral. Mm -hmm. This is notes, notes yeah. for now. So one has the notion of, you know, you're working for, you're in building a collection that you think is going to be, is going to be there for a long time. Right. And so the decision making must happen in a different way from, or does it happen differently from the way you're thinking about? Absolutely. Prospect 3. Could you talk about that? Yeah. Um, well, in, uh, the negotiation is, you know, as I mentioned, there's, there's a team of us. Um, but I think that with, with, with thinking about what you just said, there are, there are artists where I want both. And I want it both ways. I want that to remain in the collection, to be in one specific place for as long as, I mean, you know, we talk about forever, but of course not, but something. Um, and then others where, poof, it's gone. Um, we're doing, I mean, there are, there are parts of the exhibition where, you know, there, there, are, there are, it's specifically parts of the exhibition where who knows what it's gonna be at the end. And in some cases, there's not even necessarily a, an object there at all. So I think that, that the space of, of those types of exhibitions, you know, hopefully we are picking up on some of the more uh, experimental things that one can't do in an institutional framework or in a, in a museum institutional framework. Mm -hmm. um, it's still an institutional framework. But I think that we can think more open-ended. And also part of what we'd like to see happen is that you know, and, and I think this comes from the mission um, of the exhibition in it being something that was um, initiated as a, uh, in response to catastrophe, for lack of, lack of a better word, uh, is that, well, what are you left with? And so we want to do some things that, that leave something, that leave something really, really tangible for people who are there. And I don't necessarily believe that the object is what is going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we want to do things that facilitate actions 
um, that leaves something for people to build on or, for, mm -hmm. or, or at least to, to have. Uh, so that's an important part of it. Um, and I was thinking about that in relation to, uh, you know, thinking of, of, of Boys 100 Days and the political element to the exhibition is something that is, is really important. Um, not that it isn't when you do a show in a museum, but it's quite different. And the expectations are more immediate, at least, at least they are now. Do you find your curatorial strategies and methodologies different from international curators based on your interaction with, you said Peter Wright, Bible, and Oakley Laser? Do you guys share those practices at all or strategies? I think we all do to some some to some extent. Um, I I guess there are there are different pockets, right? So I just came from a curators conference um, this past weekend, and so that was like sixty curators all from American institutions. Some of those institutions are collecting, so that will put us in one little bowl. Some of them were non collecting, so that's a little bit different. Um, it, missions always vary according to context, but I would say that there is a conversation amongst us that, that is, is shared. And when you bring up the um, international, I would say especially now that the conversation is often the same conversation. If not the same conversation, it's happening in the same spaces. So. Yeah. Thank you for such an interesting conversation. I'm interested in something you said in response to not this last question, but the question just before, in terms of leaving, and correct me if I'm summarizing inappropriately or incorrectly, but in terms of leaving a legacy that's not just based in your collection's objects. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you can speak about the um, Rockla's relationship to digitizing and digitization practices, and whether that's in terms of collections management and or public access. Uh, digitization of, of the collection? Well, I think we, we take a progressive stance in terms of making available archival material. So I think we were one of the first museums to put like older catalogs online and to make them available as PDFs. Um, as far as like the collection, oh yeah, and the collection as well. We've also recently put a lot of images, something, something thousands of images uh, online that are there and readily available for anybody to take. Um, and of course, so those are all pieces or images that can be licensed without um, ARS, I would imagine, the Artist Rights Society. Um, and so we're, we're very much open to that. Um, we also try not to bother people when they're taking pictures in the permanent collection galleries, which I think now I know is progressive because I was standing in the Andy Warhol Museum of all places the other day, and I'm like this, and the woman, and I thought she was kidding. Uh, I can't take a picture in the Andy Warhol Museum. Um, so yeah, we have been, and I think that idea is something that um, we only see as, as it's part of, of um, it's part of what a museum is and should be. Uh, we share images, people share images, it's good for us at the same time. Um, one of the like events that we did online was to have people submit their best uh, image of the urban light. And so it was like a contest or something, and you win a membership round. So we've tried to be pretty progressive in that regard. I hope that helps. So Franklin, um, beyond Prospect, <coughs> beyond your current projects at Lackman now, what projects are you really dreaming of? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a good question. <laughs> Ah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I have one that is um, started at, at LACMA, which is this, this show called Rage Against the Machine, um, from the other story to sensation. And it's supposed to be all about the 90s. So other story is 
1989 in London. Sensation ends in Brooklyn, I think, in 2001, which is when I would have seen it. And so those are the kind of bookmarks, and also to suggest in some ways, talk about curatorial conversation. Uh, in some ways, uh, I think Helen Molesworth's recent exhibition, which was about the 80s, sort of made the, I think, the, I think it was like identifying the last point at which you could make a show about a time period that could be, cons that could be led by Americans. Um, it was, there was a lot of New York, there was a lot of LA, but there was, it was a very American take, and I don't think you can do that after that point. So that's, that would be something if, um, I'd like to see that come to fruition. I've got a, maybe a bit strange question. Um, what's the role uh, of art for you today? <laughs> I try to answer it fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, the role is to carry beauty and ideas at the same time. Um, it may do that separately, but I think that is the, the overall role. That, just in a, a quick answer. <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> so um, I think it was Peter Sheldahl that came up with, was it the biennialism or? Festivalism. Festivalism. Um, so I'm wondering how you're thinking about festivals. Referencing Seinfeld and Festivus. Oh. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> How are you thinking about festivalism in terms of big showy artworks that make a big impression on viewers versus smaller works that are more contemplative or quieter, I should say not necessarily smaller, but quieter, and how those two approaches to making art coexist in a large, I'm assuming, international exhibition um, for Prospect 3? Yeah. I, I would certainly probably lean towards the latter. Um, and I would say that that's both inside the institution and that prospect. Um, I think there are there are I, there are things at play that make these exhibitions inherently festivalist. Um, we're going to have an opening weekend that's I think three days, mm -hmm. and there should be a festival. Um, but. There are elements of that that will be uh, part of the duration of the exhibition. Artists are making a situation, an installation, that will be a place for people to perform in. So it'll mean one thing at that time, and then it'll mean another thing later. But there, there'll be enough, you know, there'll be enough left over after that for it to suggest something. I think a little bit more poetic, less its initial usage. Uh, there are, I think, several um, artists, or well, se several I ideas that I'd like to see touched on that don't necessarily play to uh, a larger scale type thing, but do hopefully demand a more intimate kind of view. And I, I think um, coming from the Carnegie, I'd say that that was something that, that we share. Perhaps, at least I hope. Okay. Are you um, coming into this field from the particular route you took? Concerned at all about the proliferation of graduate programs and curatorial studies? <laughs> <laughs> and might you have any uh, interesting suggestions to uh, help them not create a lot of? <laughs> thematically inclined desperate young curators. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way that Bruce eloquently deals with this in the introduction is that <laughs> he explains that what is a consequence of many of these programs is that you have a lot more collective curatorial. And I, I, I think there's something to that. Um, I don't, are you speaking only in the context of, of the curatorial programs or in MFA programs? Well, that question could certainly come up as well, but I was speaking about curatorial in particular in the sense of, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, I think that the, the collective idea is something that we've seen, but at, at the end of the day, it seems to me that these, the people I meet in these programs are, are interesting intellectuals who don't necessarily see an endpoint as being the museum, or in some cases, the endpoint being an exhibition, exhibition making for that matter. So I find it interesting as a platform for other things and for other kinds of thought. Yeah, that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I taught at Bard a bit. Uh -huh. And those sort of engagements, to me, have, have been really um, helpful and influential. So I'd also like kind of, uh, in terms of thinking about our own ways in which we adapt or evolve, um, I think it's an interesting conversation. And that's certainly a change. I mean, when I took yeah. part in the first few years, and everyone wanted the job as a yeah, curator yeah, in yeah. an institution. And that pretty much has gone by the way. <laughs> well, for, the for realistic reasons as well as theoretical. It's not the same. That's true. Yeah. Um, in relation to the whole globalization issue and supporting more decentralizing content from the West and all that. Do you um, foster any collaborations with curators and arts professional from, let's say, Asia, I would say, because it's the best <coughs> closest to from the Pacific side, or um, from the world in general, other than the States? Oh, yeah. We, yeah, we try. I mean, that's the one good thing about those. I mean, there's the proliferation of art fairs, but if you get to do that and you can, in a way, the art fairs provide more gigs. And so it allows us to come together and have conversations face to face in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. I mean, yeah, people can travel to these large exhibitions that happen periodically. And I mean, when you talk about things like Venice and Documenta, obviously they are so central that that they are uh, so populated. But I have found that the one saving grace for me, as far as the proliferation of art fairs, is that I get to see colleagues from all over the place. But do you foster that like within LACMA? Within LACMA, yeah, we try, absolutely. Um, we try to foster everywhere, though. <laughs> you know, like, as much as possible. I would say that we do have some links in that direction, like you said. We actually have a team in Australia right now. There's an exhibition from our deck arts department that is in Australia. So there's a bunch of people there right now. Um, Korea, LA is the biggest Korean population outside of Korea. I've been there more than a few times in the last few years. We actually have an, we actually have an acquisition pool specifically for Korean contemporary art. Um, so yeah, we do, th we do. And I, one of the exhibitions that I did a couple of years ago was about bringing Ai Weiwei's Zodiac to LA. So it's definitely something that we've tried to, to think about and foster. We also have one of the bigger collections of South and Southeast Asian um, and antique art. So now we're trying to figure out how to put some other things in conversation. And thanks to, um, I mean, Tyler Rollins is based here, but uh, we had an exhibition of a young, a young woman from Thailand who shows with him. Uh, her name is Pinnery San Patak. Um, that was a few months ago. We also just made a first acquisition of an artist named Agus Suwage from Indonesia. So that's somebody who's also going to be in prospect. So we, yeah, we're looking that way. I also think, well, like, importantly, I don't know, somebody asked me recently about um, recommendations for <coughs> curators. And um, a, a, I think a name that comes up a, a lot now is BC Silva. Uh, BC started a project in Lagos, and she travels nonstop and is, uh, I think, done a couple of projects in Switzerland recently and is, is, is brilliant. Um, so we try to foster what's going on there. I mean, especially in places where you don't know, which is, I think, been part of the interesting part of the 
rise of a more whatever internationalist conversation. Um, yeah, it's a it's a big part of it. Hi, um, I was just wondering if you could uh, unpack a little bit your conversation about um, what sounded like a commissioning of a performance artist to work with objects in the collection that are on display. And you know, what is a? How do you determine what is a an appropriate compensation for that artist if it's not an existing work or? Would you consider also acquiring that work, like in, in the context of thinking about radical presence, and which has a kind of wonderful overview of historic pieces, but also new pieces um, for those artists that work in performance? That it's a challenging position in relationship to museums and collections, and you're bringing them in, and it, it, it brings a new vision to kind of Sarah's installation. You know, how how is that artist compensated? Uh, to tell you the truth, in that situation, um, Jose Luis Blondet was worked most closely with her. Uh, so I don't know exactly the specifics. I believe she got something for the actual performance, and was you know which was part of a budget that she submitted. Um, but Liz is somebody where we're also already in negotiation for acquisitions. So that's happening at the same time. I mean, I think that's integral. Anybody that we're, well, almost anybody that we're trying to work with, uh, you, you probably think it's something that should end up in the collection as well. So I think that's an uh, integral part of the conversation. Um, it's uh, the moment is kind of a trend that artists are being invited to museums to work uh, with the permanent collection. What do you think about artists as curators? It's two questions. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It's interesting to hear you say it's, it's a trend now. Um, I kind of go in and out of that and, and interest in that. And would, you, would maybe Andy Warhol would rate the icebox 1961 is a good, I think, reference point, at least puts us somewhere, gives us some history to deal with. Um, most recently for me, I had worked with Maurizio Catalan to go through the Manila collection and insert him, him, himself into that. Um, I think that I'm always interested in what certain artists have to say. And if they say it in that framework, um, I'm, I'm interested to know. So overall, I guess, the question is always it's interesting. Um, it also goes kind of back to a time when maybe artists were doing that more. And now, you know, we all get these sort of focus points and specializations. And so it's always interesting to throw that into the mix as well. What? Bruce, one more question? Yeah, one more question. Go ahead. Uh, my question is sort of the flip side of that. What do you think of um, curators as artists, and particularly <laughs> in relation to this question of authorship and curators creating commissions uh, for artists, as you're describing, which is a, a creative process, and, and curators engaging with artists sometimes, working together to create artistic productions. Do you see yourself in any sense as an artist, or do you have a Clear division in your mind. Very clear. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I took a photo class once. <laughs> um, no, I'm. I mean, happy that I come out. Of, you could also say that some of the, the the writing aspect can almost be cliche in some ways, like poetry. We mentioned Sheldahl, Frank O'Hara. Um, so I like that tradition. Um, but I don't see myself as making the actual work. I love having a certain distance on that. Good, well, Franklin, thank you so much. It's Thanks.